this question just like gets me out of bed every morning. It's always been plants. I've always loved plants. I've always studied them. I work with a beautiful, beautiful flower. This is Molly Edwards. She gave a lecture on this channel on a beautiful flower indeed called Aqualegia. I think her research says something really fascinating about the nature of creativity, but before we can get into that, let's look at something completely different that might actually be the same. Uh, bear with me a moment. So there's this cool little Wikipedia page about this idea called multiple discovery. The concept of multiple discovery is the idea that scientific discoveries and inventions are made independently and more or less simultaneously by multiple scientists. The page cites the 17th century independent formulation of calculus by Newton and Leibniz, and the theory of evolution of species independently advanced by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. This kind of thing actually happens pretty frequently. It's as if once there are social conditions to support a certain idea, it just kind of emerges, and if one person doesn't publish it, another one will. And then there's this enigmatic paper on ruminant headgear. See, there are four unique kinds of pointy skull things that hoofed animals can grow. Deer have antlers, and cows have horns, and giraffes have these little nubby things. And the paper points out that it's possible that all types of headgear have independent origins. In other words, the common ancestor to deer and cows and giraffes may not have had headgear, but for some strange reason, each lineage was able to evolve very similar structures independently. So the question is, what could cause this? What is it about ruminant skulls that makes headgear likely? And why is it that two people independently came up with evolutionary theory in the 1860s, but not the 1760s? Well, now let's get back to Molly. She studies the evolution and development of Aquilegia nectar spurs. The nectar spurs are these long hollow petals here that make nectar for their pollinators. The diversity of these nectar spurs just within Aquilegia is like amazing. We can think of Aquilegia as having three main pollination syndromes. These are like suites of characters that are associated with a certain pollinator that visits them. On the left, we have these small curved spurs, and this is indicative of a bee pollination syndrome. Whereas the the red long spurs here are associated with a hummingbird pollination syndrome. And then the even longer slender spurs tend to be kind of pale colored are associated with hawk moth pollinators. And hawk moths are known to have extremely long proboscis. And the evolutionary history of these pollination syndromes, their phylogeny, shows this funny pattern of multiple discovery. <laughs> phylogeny is magical. There have been multiple independent evolutions and transitions between pollination syndromes. So they mapped two transitions between bee to hummingbird. So we see one here and another down here. So that means that these two ancestors separately figured out how to get pollinated by hummingbirds. And then once you had the hummingbird syndrome, there were even more separate instances of the evolution of the hawk moth syndrome. Oh my gosh, this has happened multiple independent times. First one is here. So we have a hummingbird ancestor, and we have an evolution of hawk moth while all these guys stayed hummingbird. Over here, we have this ancestor that's hummingbird, stays hummingbird over here, but a ton of these guys evolved hawk moth pollination. Again, hummingbird ancestor, independent evolution of hawk moth, hummingbird ancestor, lots more hawk moth, hummingbird ancestor. Even more. So time after time, these flowers stumble upon the same pollination adaptations. Does that mean that the discovery of these forms was inevitable? Well, in his book Investigations, Stuart Kaufman says that evolution is a process of exploring the adjacent possible. With the evolution of each new biological form, new possibilities open up adjacent to it, waiting to be filled. So from this perspective, each new pollination syndrome is a possibility, a potential, opened up by the previous Aquilegia form. But of course, this just raises more questions than it answers, really. What on earth is a possibility? Possibilities don't have physical form, you can't point to them, but they're nonetheless real. They have real effects in the world. Possibilities can create new forms that have never before been seen and yet have predictably patterned structure. Forms like beautiful, beautiful flowers. Beautiful, beautiful flower. So this video is part of a class called the Evos Seminar Series, and one of the best parts about this class is that we get to speak with these incredible lecturers who are just so 
passionate. The enthusiasm that Molly has is contagious. There's a link to her full lecture in the description. So that's what I want to understand, how to be curvy. Mm. It's just so neat. Ah, it's like such a cool system. And you can cross the bejesus out of like all these guys. Like, what is this species? Oh, they're so cool. Oh my God. I can't talk about them without a huge smile on my face. Mm. Wow. So cool. Stuff like that is just like, what? <laughs> yeah. My first word was flower. <laughs> I don't know. They've, uh, they've always been so magical. And I was like, what about their development? Like, you know, like, what? Like, okay, we have, we see these evolutionary relationships, but like, I want to know, like, like, how are these petals working? And like, what's different? And like, why are we seeing the evolutionary relationships we're seeing? And I think I was totally captivated. Something clicked really nicely. Yeah.